But we now come to um, our third lesson in our prophetic genre course, and this one is entitled Sermon Analysis. Sermon Analysis. Now, this is something that will be kind of new for you um, in terms of looking at prophetic genre. So this one, Sermon Analysis, and our next lesson, Foretelling, are going to be some new aspects that you need to be aware of because you will find these appearing within a uh, prophetic genre. When you're exiting the prophetic genre, one of the order, important aspects to study is this, what I call sermonic material that shows up in the passages. It'll appear in the prophetic passages. Now, sermonic material does not show up in a different format. It either will be in the format of a narrative or a poetic format. But it's, it's not, and not every narrative and, and, and poetic passage is sermonic. Um, even though it's a part of prophetic genre. But it's, you, you will know it when you see it. And, and what I want to do is help you spot what that is, help you understand how to uh, observe it and be able to interpret it. Sermons appear in various places throughout Scripture, especially in passages designated under the prophetic genre. And you've heard this expression, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. You find that a lot in the prophetic genre uh, passages. You'll see that phrase show up. And when it does, usually what it means is God had given the prophet a message, had spoken to the prophet beforehand, and said, this is what you will say. And when you stand in front of the people, you say to the people, thus says the Lord. And then you begin to dictate word for word what I told you to tell them. Uh, and that was the, 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 that was the job of the prophet. That was what the prophet was to do, was to be a spokesman for God and tell the people, thus says the Lord. And so if you look at passages like Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 to 31, chapter 2, verse 1 to verse, chapter 4, verse 6, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 to, to verse 30, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, chapter 3, verse 5, uh, chapter 3, verse 6 to 6, chapter 6, verse 30 in Jeremiah. Chapter 7, verse 1 to 10, 25, Ezekiel. Chapter 6, verse 1 to 14. These are passages within the prophetic genre that contain sermonic material. These are sermons. And you will see just from the length of these, just from the verse references, that they can be lengthy. And again, they can appear in narrative format or poetic format. And so even though you may have already studied these passages in terms of its narrative uh, characteristics and the, or the poetical characteristics, you still have to take it to a deeper level when you know that it's actually a sermon as well. You've got to go back through the passage and, and go deeper than you would just in studying the poetry or the narrative aspects of it and look a little deeper and begin to ask yourself, how is this sermon structured? What is being said here in, in, in terms of its context? So when sermons appear in the prophetic literature, it could be in the form of a narrative genre or a poetical genre, or it could be in a combination of the both. That's why it's important as you start with doing your narrative and poetical analyst first, analyze those first, before proceeding to the sermonic components of the passage. Now, is there a book out there or a resource that would list every sermon in the prophetic books? No, I haven't found one. If one exists, let me know um, where it will tell you, okay, here's all the sermons out of the book of Isaiah. Here's all the sermons out of the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so on. I haven't seen a resource like that, especially online. Uh, in a chart or something like that. Be, maybe it would be nice to have that. Uh, but I have not come across it. So the, the way you tell if it's a sermon is just by the nature of what you're reading. You're going to look at it and you're going to see that, that the prophet, the man of God, is standing before the people to proclaim what the Lord has told him to say. You just want to be aware of that. That phrase, thus says the Lord, will, will be a good launching pad. It'll, it'll be a good point to, to look at and, and be a good phrase to, 
to point out that, okay, this is um, something God wants them to know. And usually it's in the framework of either that, thus says the Lord, or it's that God is telling the prophet, you tell them these exact words. Don't change it. Don't take it away. Don't, don't embellish it. Don't explain it. Just say it exactly as I've given it to you. And then that passage is a sermon. So that's how you're going to be able to detect it and observe it. But you need to understand how to analyze it. When you, when you, when you know that it's a sermon, you've got to ask yourself, how do I analyze that sermon? How, how do I go about the process of, of examining it to understand it? Now, yes, I've done the poetical or the narrative aspects of it. I, I've seen if there's figurative language. I've already done textual observations. Uh, hopefully you've done some historical background already. Uh, you may have done significant words. Probably not at this point. And so uh, you want to be aware of that going forward. But again, when you look at the sermonic parts of it, that's new. And so what is the procedure? How do you do this? Well, actually, it's not going to be that difficult in one sense of the word. Because ever since we start, started the program, the preaching program, you've been designing sermons, right? You've been creating sermons. You've been working on sermon content documents. Well, you've got to think of it this way. The, 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 the verses that you're looking at, that's actually the sermonic material, think of it like a sermon content document. That is the prophet's sermon content document. That is God's sermon content document given to them for them to give to the people. You've got to think of it that way. Actually, you've been analyzing sermons already. You've been analyzing your own sermon. You've been analyzing sermons that I preach in class or your professor preaches in class. You've been analyzing sermons that you may have, have, have listened to of others or watched from others, maybe outside of class, online, or inside class during preaching labs. You've been analyzing. So what are you going to do? How, how, what's the procedure? You're going to analyze a sermon. So since every sermon contains primary matters, what, why, how? Guess what you're going to do? You're going to try to discover what is the what, the why, and the how of the sermon that the prophet has to preach to the people. You say, it's, I'm doing the same thing? Yeah, you're doing the same thing. It's not like this is something, in a sense, totally brand new. A sermon is a sermon. Every sermon has a what, why, how. No matter if that sermon was preached today, yesterday, or many, many, many years ago, it has a what, why, how. And usually there's an introduction and a body and conclusion, right? Remember how when you write your sermon content documents, you have introduction, you have, you have a, a body and a conclusion. Same for this. Now, the one difference I will tell you is that in biblical sermons, sermons that appear in this text, you know the steps that we work through in terms of the introduction, the steps that we walk through, uh, and then the, the steps that we walk through in terms of the body and the conclusion? You may not find all of those there in that order. I'll just be honest with you. That's where some of the uniqueness can be. But usually you can find there is, a, there is a, an introduction, a body conclusion. And so you want to be aware of that. You're going to look for what is the verse range for the introduction, what is the verse range for the body, what is the verse range for the conclusion, and, and by studying that sermon and, ask, and, and discovering as much as you can from it, you're going to ask these three questions. What is the what, what is the why, and what is the how? You need to answer those questions. And I'll be honest with you. If you're preaching a prophetic passage that is also a contains a sermon that has a sermon in it guess what if you find the what why how of that sermon what is your what why how going to be most likely it's going to be the same again not all prophetic passages contain a sermon the prophetic passage that's been assigned to you may not be sermonic in nature it may not be but if it is you have to be able to know how to do this. 
and even if your passage for the class is not a sermon you're going if you want to preach through prophetic books you're going to you're going to find them they're there and you're going to have to know how to interpret them and how to understand them so you start with the what why how and you look for the introduction the body and the conclusion it's the appropriate way to analyze sermons that appear in prophetic texts so you identify the same elements you want to uh, uh, identify the formal introduction of the sermon you want to identify the formal body of the sermon you want to identify the formal conclusion of the sermon you want to identify the what and the why and the how elements those are the things that you want to be aware of now there is a word of caution it's needed when analyzing sermons that appear in the prophetic passages even though the procedure stated above identify those formal elements is the preferred way you care must be taken not to force a sermonic text that appears in the biblical text to fully adhere to what I call current homiletical structures I, I kind of already mentioned this so again there is going to be an introduction body conclusion for the most part that's, you're going to find those things but they may not follow the exact homiletical structure within that like those seven steps for introduction and you know there may be there may not be much illustration but then they may be lo plentiful illustrations so you want to be careful you want to be careful you don't want to try to fit the passage into a preconceived homiletical framework uh, that we may use today however there are certain things that do appear and those things that you're to, to identify, you, will sh you should be able to find those things. So you, you don't want to go too deep where you make the passage say something it's never meant to say. But at the same time, you've got to know how to at least approach studying the passage from a sermon point of view. Some even say like the book of Hebrews is a sermon. A very lengthy sermon, but a sermon nonetheless. Uh, book of Hebrews is not a prophetic text, but sermons appear. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that's actually a narrative passage, but it's a sermon. And there is a what, why, how for that. So what you want to do is follow the principle that the passage needs to speak for itself and that the goal of exegesis is to discover um, how the speaker structured his sermon so as to communicate the message given to him exactly and precisely by the Lord. I go back to that, thus says the Lord phrase. That's what you want to do. Again, don't make the passage say too much than it means. Don't read too much into it. There's a balance here. You want to identify those things, seek to identify those, you know, the what is the introduction, body conclusion? What is the what, why, how? You want to identify those things, but at the same time, you don't want to force it to follow exactly down to the, uh, each individual step. Um, what we use in current homiletical methodology, especially within this course and within the program. So hopefully that makes sense. That's how you want to think about in terms of a procedure for sermonic analysis. Again, there's no mysticism here, no no mystical way to do this it's just a practical way of looking at the text um, to be able to analyze it and so what i'm going to transition to is give you a couple of examples to look at uh, and kind of be able to to start the pump so to speak get you kind of acquainted with how to look at sermonic material within um, old testament prophetic passages and and then we're going to do much more in class but Again, let's move to some examples, a couple examples, and I think that will help you. The first example I want to look at is Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 31. This is a sermon. This is a sermon. And it's in poetical form. Poetical form. And, and I'm, you're seeing this, the passage on the screen, and I'm not going to go through every single verse, um, but I want you to kind of get a perspective of, of this. Now, 
At this point, if, if I'm going to study that passage in terms of doing a sermon analysis on it, I've already, um, already have had to do any narrative portions, which there's not really any there. Um, it's really in poetical form. So I would have to have already done a poetical analysis of the passage. And, um, and, and gone through the line relationships, the historical background, textual observations. I would have done all that already. And, and I would have been gathering a sense of what is the passage about and working through it. But then, knowing that it's a sermon, I'm going to give it a deeper analysis. And I'm going to ask the questions. What is the what, why, how? Where, what's the introduction? What is the body? What is the formal conclusion? Is, does, is that very much detectable? Now, you've got to make decisions. You've got to make choices. You're not going to see in the passage, introduction, these verses, body, these verses, conclusion. You know, you're not going to see that in any printed Bible. And, and they, don't, they don't give you any advance warning that uh, you're, in, you're transitioning from one section to another. It sometimes can be very subtle. And so when you're, when you're doing this sermon analysis, it's, it could be, you've got to make choices. And the way you look at it may not be exactly the way somebody else would, and that's okay. You've got to make the choices and go with what you f how you feel and sense the Lord leading you in studying that passage and, um, and think it through. And maybe talk to other pastors about it, and especially other ones who know what they're doing and have gone through this process as well. But eventually you've you got to land somewhere. You've got to land the plane somewhere, and you've got to be able to answer these questions. So... As you're looking at the passage on the screen, I want you to see what, how I arrived at this and the, 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 the answers to those questions that I came up with. And so, introduction, body, conclusion. Start there. So I'm looking at the passage, and I can see chapters 1, verse 2 to 4, kind of being in the introduction. It's, it's the broad statement of what God is making there, what he's telling Isaiah there, the prophet. And then you get to verse 5, all the way to verse 23 would be the body of it, the body of that, of that passage in terms of the sermon, with the conclusion being verses 24 to 31. Now, there's exegetical reasons for that. And, and I'm looking at the text. I've, I, again, I've already, by this point, I've already done my full analysis of the poetry. I've gone through it just like I would a psalm. And... and but I also have to think and put structure to it in terms of introduction, body, conclusion. I've got to at least see if I can detect that. And then I'm, as I'm working through that, now I'm thinking through not only as a, as a poetical passage, but as a sermon at the same time. I'm asking myself, what is the what, why, how? What is that broad subject matter? And, and from what I can gather... You know, usually, right, the introduction is where the what and the why is. Remember that? And the how shows up in the body. And in the conclusion, all of it's reiterated, repeated, maybe in conceptual form. So I'm, I'm using that knowledge, and I'm asking myself, I'm looking in the introduction, I'm asking, what is, what is the what? What's the issue here? Well, God's telling Isaiah, tell the people. There, there's this issue of indwelling sin in the people. That's how this book starts. He's describing indwelling sin, inherent within the people that reside in the country. And Isaiah's preaching to the northern tribe. Why is he talking about indwelling sin? Because as he mentions, they're blinded to it. There's a blindness that's come with their indwelling sin. They don't see their own sinfulness. So what's God doing? He, he, he's having to confront the blindness of indwelling sin. Since they're blinded to indwelling sin, that needs to be changed. They can't be blind anymore. They need to open their eyes and see their own sinfulness. So what does the Lord do what is, by what he tells Isaiah? From verse 5 to verse 23, he's, he's wanting the blindness to indwelling sin, that that changes by the people understanding the extensiveness of their sin, the deception of their sin, 
and the devastation that's caused by their sin. There's your sermon. That, that's, it's a sermon that Isaiah has to preach to the people. And it's in poetical form. Again, I just didn't go to a commentary or a book and just, oh, what did they say? I did a, a poetical, a full poetical analysis already before I even began to think about it as a sermon. And how do I know it was a sermon? Because as I was doing the poetical analysis, going deeply into the text, working through it, it became very evident that it's a sermon. Because it was something God told Isaiah to say to the people. Speak this to the people. Tell this to the people. And so he does. He has to do that. So there's your what, why, how. If I was going to preach this passage, what do you think I would do? What do you think my what, why, how is going to be? Exactly that. I don't have to even create a what, why, how. It's done for me. The Lord laid it out. That's why, actually, these sermons, when you come across one in the prophetic passages, they're actually the most beautiful thing to preach because you're not preaching even your own sermon. Yeah, you're going to amplify it. If, I, if I'm preaching through this, this could take... this. I wouldn't do this in one Sunday. This would be a development. This may would take two weeks, maybe even three. Depending on how deep I want to go into the words, and then, you know, as I did significant words, and, and analyze it, and talk about it, and bring it into our contemporary world, and apply it to our culture and our day. But there's my structure already given to me. I just had to discern it. I had to arrive at it. I had to see it. I had to observe it. Already inherent within the inerrant text. And so it's actually fun. It's actually a joy to be able to study these kinds of passages and be able to uh, see what the Lord is saying. I mean, that's a, deep, that's a deep issue in dwelling sin. I mean, that's a serious issue. And if you're going to preach that to your people, that should wake them up, I would think. And you don't have, you know, you don't have to try, try to create them or, or make them be aware of their own sin. Just let the text speak for itself and just amplify that. Walk through that passage. There it is. God's talking to them using you as a mouthpiece. Just as he talked to the current gener the generation of Isaiah's day through the prophet Isaiah. Same message, same what, why, how. Well, here's another one. From the prophet Ezekiel. Now this one's in narrative form, not poetical form. This uh, Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 3 to 14. So you're going to see on the screen the narrative structure of it. And, and again, I would have already done narrative analysis to, it, to whatever level I can do it. I would have, uh, I would, uh, anything about character, setting, scenes, you know, uh, it, it could be a little bit unique when the narrative is a sermon. You may not find many characters in it, but then you may. It, it can be a little bit different than like a story. But I would at least examine it as much narrative elements to it as possible. I would see if there's a progression of thought, and I would have analyzed it, done textual observations as much as I could. But then I would go through the process again of what is the introduction, the body, conclusion, what is the what, why, how. So here the introduction is chapter 6, verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3. And then the body is chapter 6, verses 4 to 10. And then the conclusion, verse 11 to 14. And again, you may would look at it and not exactly arrive at those breakdowns for the introduction, body, conclusion. Again, like I said before, you make choices. You have to make decisions. But that, that's how this would work. Then as I analyze that structure, I'm going to ask, what is the what, the why, and the how? And, and there's things in the text that, that bring this reality to me that, that help me in ascertaining the answers to those questions. And so this one is about the Lord's deity, the Lord's deity. And the problem was, they had removed it. 
They had removed the Lord's deity out of, the, out of their life. They didn't have a respect for the Lord's deity, for who the Lord is. They were following after idols, worshiping idols, violating the first commandment from the book of Exodus 20. And God has to, through the prophet Ezekiel, remind them of that problem. You don't remove the Lord's deity out of your life. So what is God going to do? So how you, here's the how. God judges idolatry and, and states the extent to which he despises it. That's what he's doing in this passage. Idolatry opposes God's right of being the only one to receive glory from his creation, from those who he created. Since idolatry attempts to transfer glory to another, worshiping an idol, and remove the Lord's deity from one's life, what does the Lord have to do? He judges it. To defend his deity and sovereignty. That's what he's doing here. That's what, he's, that's what Ezekiel is going to have to tell the people. This is what God's going to do. This is what God has to do. And how will God do that? This defense that God is going to make it will be accomplished by two ways. By destroying all the elements of idol worship. He's going to talk about how it's all going to come to nothing. Verses 4 to 7. And then verses 8 to 10. By reminding everyone about the dangers of idol worship. He's going to wipe it out and remind them of the dangers of it. That's his methodology for you want to remove the Lord's deity from your life? I'll tell you what happens. At, as, this is the consequences of it. Here's the consequences of removing the Lord's deity from your life. Of not worshiping the Lord. Of worshiping idols. God will destroy it and, he'll re, and He will remind you about the dangers of it. There's the sermon. There it is. So if I'm going to preach this, what, what's going to be my sermon structure? Right there. So when you're analyzing a sermon in the prophetic passages, the structure will, will, you will arrive at the structure. That's what you're trying to analyze. That's what you're trying to ascertain. The details of the passage, you're going to have studied through textual observations, your narrative analysis or poetical analysis. You're going to see any figures of speech. You, you, and then you, you, know, you add the significant words to it. So what we're going to do in class is I'm going to give you an example of sermon analysis from Isaiah 6 because the whole passage, the entire passage is not a sermon, but there is a part. There is a part of the passage that is. God will tell Isaiah, go say this to the people. And, and so we're going to analyze those verses, which I think are in poetical form. We're going to analyze those verses from a sermon point of view. And... What we're going to do, we're going to use that visual method of exegesis that I'm, that I'm showing you in class. And, and, and that, so you'll see an example of it. Now, I'm using Isaiah 6 because the entire passage is not a sermon. So, when you have the sermon as part of the larger passage, that adds an interesting dynamic to it. Because the sermon is not the entire passage, it's just a part of the passage. And so it it has a servant role in terms of how I would preach the entire passage. Okay? And you'll see how I do that and when, I, when I, eventually, when, I, when you see the sermon content document. You'll see how this, how this appears. But it's still good to look at it. And so in class, we're going to look at Isaiah 6. Um, but we may also look at another passage. One that is a full sermon. And I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do. Uh, but I will by the time we go have class. You'll see. And, um, and we'll examine it in class, and I will have already done some analysis of it in terms of the narrative or the poetic announcement, analysis or whatever needs to be done, kind of give you a framework for what I'm seeing, and then we'll, we'll, we'll work on that um, together, or maybe I'll get you in groups to do that as well.
But again, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to study the passage when you know it's a sermon. So we're going to look at this in class and deal with what is sermon analysis? Um, how do you go about the procedure? So this could give you an introduction to it, kind of give you an overview of what we're doing. So make sure you watch, have watched this video before class meeting uh, when we're going to discuss this. You can see on your schedule in your, in your manual of when we're having the class uh, discussion. And I think it's going to be a great time together. So again, thanks for watching and look forward to seeing you in the class when we talk about sermon analysis.